Welcome, my friends. This is Maniacal Incorporated, and you join me after a lengthy absence from Crusader Kings 3, long time no CK3. I wasn't all that impressed or enthused with the arrival of His Holiness the Pope. He was patched in as the head of Insular Christianity there a couple of months ago, and I wasn't really all that delighted with the way it was handled, and I haven't really played the game since. I kind of took a bit of a break. Been playing a lot of Houses of Caldaria there with the last while, and Sea of Thieves. But somebody who hasn't abandoned the game, somebody who has been playing and working away on it, is Mandead, or Pied Noir, the mod behind the Tip Volume 2 mod. And based on some of the videos that I put up around the patching in of the Pope, he has made a couple of changes uh, to his mod, a couple of changes in Ireland. So I'm returning to the Tip Volume 2 mod to see what exactly he has done. And we can already, on the loading screen, see one of the big changes up there in the top left-hand corner. Petty King Thorluk, not the False King Murica. Thorluk has been added and restored to his rightful place. This is the historically accurate King of Munster in the year 1066. And I think this is going to make for the first historically accurate playthrough, Munster playthrough, since Crusader Kings 1. Because Thorluk was the King of Munster in CK1, or CK. But uh, they went off then and read the Wikipedia article and got mixed up for CK2. And those mistakes made it into CK3. I've made uh, a video, of course, on Murica and how Murica ended up, uh, how he incorrectly ended up in the game. So we're going to play as Petty King Thorluk. We're going to take uh, a look at uh, what changes have been uh, have been made. This has impressed me greatly. By the mid-11th century, the High Kingship of Ireland has fallen in and out of the Ivrian grasp as the Irish noble houses have warred over territory both against each other and the encroaching Norse Gaels. In the midst of this chaos, the ambitious Thorluk has recently deposed his uncle Dunica, the man who murdered his father Taig. Thorluk's throne is far from secure, however, as he must contend with his envious cousin Murica, as well as the powerful king of Leinster, who funded his recent coup. Can you cement Thorluk's grasp on Munster and reclaim the High Kingship? for the Ivrian once again. That is much more coherent and sensible than the nonsense that, that we had for Murica. Uh, even though little is known about Murica, there's a reason for that. Murica was never the King of Munster. Uh, this just looks much better. And like I said, the, the ability to actually get to follow in Thorluk's footsteps. He's the King of Munster, but he is under the vassalage of Diarmid Machmuel Namo, or he has at least submitted to Diarmid, and to seize control of Munster, and to then eventually rise to the High Kingship himself, to actually get to follow that journey. It's going to be a lot more interesting than playing as that old fool. So we're going to start, we're going to start. I never wanted to do a Murica playthrough. I never wanted to do a Munster 1066 playthrough. Uh, when Murica was there, so I'm much more, I'm much more impressed to do one now that we have Thorluk, the man himself. And of course, if you haven't seen any of the Tip Volume 2 videos in the past, you might be a bit shook and shocked at what you're seeing. But uh, Mandate has broken out a lot of additional counties and made things uh, a lot more kind of complex. I know in one of the recent, there'll be a, a link, of course, to the Tip Volume 2 mod in the description, but... In the change files, he has added a lot of families. I think he's added the Edunlina in Leinster. I should have actually checked the 867 start. They might be present in Leinster in 867. I might do that later. But uh, So there's lots and lots and lots of changes. I'm not going to look at all of them. Uh, we're going to do a couple of things. First thing we're going to do is we're going to click on this man. We'll open up the barber shop and we'll give him some hair. What uh, what looks good in him? We'll give him a bit of hair. There you go, short wavy. That'll keep him happy. 
So I imagine there's a lot of complexity in removing one of the central characters, somebody like Murica from the game. I imagine there's a lot of kind of complexity around that. But uh, we'll give him a bit of hair to keep himself happy. That's the first thing we'll do. That's our first major change. I'm going to take a quick look at the the uh, religion and the tradition changes. And then we are going to start into building the legacy of Thorlok. With Insularism, I suppose the big change from the base game and from the previous mod that, uh, or the previous version of this mod that uh, Mandate had is that the Pope is the head of insular Christianity, not through a tenet, but is the actual head of insular Christianity. In the base game, it's very much that the Irish regard him as the head of insular Christianity, but he's not really. That's kind of the way it's handled. So it's actually handled differently here. Uh, we have communal identity and syncretic folk traditions. In the past, I was critical of this one. So monasticism comes from the, ba the base game as well. I was critical of this one and not pushed about this one. Uh, that has changed. I'm actually critical now of communal identity and I think this is actually a great addition and I'm going to be talking about this uh, later on. Not in this series, but probably in a future series. Uh, Mandate has changed marriage type back to polygamous. So when the game came out, first of all, insular Christianity was polygamous. Then it was changed to monogamous and polygamy was added as a tradition. I was very supportive of this and still am. Uh, Mandate has undone that now and he's made the marriage type polygamous again. I think I'm still supportive of the idea of getting rid of insularism completely. Or making it a carbon copy of Catholicism. I think the way Mandate is handling it at the moment actually is probably the best way, but I would like to see that change to monogamy and clerical gender back to male only. Uh, Mandate did this basically to emulate the uh, abbot of, I think it's Kildare, who was sometimes female. So you can end up with, uh, with female court chaplains in this. Uh, you are, of course, allowed to uh, change them at once, which is very fitting with what we know from, from the time period. I've, I've addressed this in other videos, so I won't go into it too much, but those are the major changes. With insularism, the big, big changes, the big, big changes are in the traditions. So we'll start with a, a look at the terrain. Bog, 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 bog. All bog. The Irish in the base game do not have the Wetlanders tradition. This is something that we've been kind of talking about on Twitch, on some of the streams that I've done, and in previous videos is the amount of bog bodies that have been found in Ireland. We know that bogs played a very important strategic role when the Normans arrived. The Irish would often ambush the Normans and their heavy cavalry uh, in boggy areas. So bog was, was quite important. Considering that it's it's the part of the map that has, other than over here, like this is the only region in the base game that actually starts with Wetlanders tradition on. So I think this is a, a good a good addition to the game, or a, a good addition to make the Irish um, have the Wetlanders tradition. Development growth, building and construction uh, cost goes down, holding construction cost goes down, supply limit goes up, and levy size in wetlands goes up. So that's going to make... Connacht a bit more powerful, which is very important for this point in time, because Connacht is basically just about to kind of overtake the other kingdoms, and will become the dominant region into the uh, until the arrival of the Normans. Refined poetry is uh, one that comes from the base game, but I think there have been improvements to it before it was almost impossible to find an Irish court poet, so I think there have been changes to that. Uh, Monastic Communities is another one that is from the base game. So the two new ones that have been added, Strong Kinship, I think is an actual base game tradition that was common in Scotland, can enact the Tanistry elective succession law. So we've seen that in my last playthrough, we didn't have access to Tanistry. A Tanistry has been removed from 
the Irish for the last while in the base game, which I think, I, I don't know why that is. Uh, Tanistry is, is one of the most enjoyable aspects of playing in the, the game, as far as I'm concerned. So, Strong Kinship adds that back in, but here is the interesting one. It is a custom tradition based on, I suppose based on some rantings and ravings that I made in one of my previous videos. Mandate has actually gone and incorporated a lot of those rants and suggestions into a Brehen Law cultural tradition. Ireland has long been divided into myriad petty kingdoms, often led by rulers engaging in age-old dynastic blood feuds. Despite justice being dispensed on local terms, there is a certain harmony between the church's canon law and the local ruler's civil or Brehen law. Key aspects of Brehen law include strict regulation of inheritance, few women or blemished men may inherit, and victims being compensated by perpetrators, either with money, goods, or services rendered. So Brehen Law, of course, is a modern term uh, used by historians to describe what was effectively the, the legal code of the Irish at this point in time. Uh, it's referred to as Shenicus, which is literally traditions, and it's written down for the first time around the, uh, the 8th century, if not earlier, and it's actually the Druids, effectively, who write it down. When Christianity arrives at Ireland, the, the Druids basically just kind of change jobs. They become the new uh, Brehen class, uh, Brehev, which would be the Irish for judge. And uh, so they become the kind of the Brehen or the, the legal class, and they will survive in one way, make, shape, or form into the 1700s, but in a, a greatly diminished capacity in the uh, after the the early 1600s and so the the laws are kind of the traditions are written down sometimes they can conflict with each other and they're kind of all over the place and the brehen class it's their job basically to interpret the laws and i've kind of gone on on big discussions about these in the past but some of the stuff that has been added ailing or disgraced rulers can abdicate their primary title by taking the retire to monastery decision uh, very common from the 900s onwards in particular. Uh, rivalries are more common. Rulers can blind prisoners. So we do know that the taking and giving of hostages was very important. And the threat that these hostages would be killed or blinded was very important for maintaining alliances and maintaining stability in lands that one ruler may have not really conquered, dominated, gained the submission of uh, Rory O'Connor, who will be the last High King before the arrival of the Normans. Uh, he blinds his way into power. Uh, we saw that um, Eid Finlia blinded Moel Shocknail Mac Moel Runaid's successor, so that would be Flanchina's father. So in the 867 start, uh, Flanchina murdered his predecessor but his predecessor was blinded and was therefore forced out of power. So blinding was a way of preventing somebody from coming to power, and it was also a way of uh, quite often of actually having people deposed, because here we have at the bottom ph uh, physically disfigured or infertile claimants cannot press their claims against rulers of this culture. We never see somebody with a blemish coming to power. They are overlooked. Once somebody loses their their eyes or uh, becomes disfigured in some way, make, shape, or form, they are effectively removed from the chain of succession. We do see people deposed as well. However, we also see people who become blemished uh, continuing to rule. So a famous example would be Dunica, who Thorlock overthrew, deposed as King of Munster, Dunica lost his arm in an assassination attempt, but continued to rule Munster afterwards, because he kind of had the uh, the power base to support him. Uh, we also have here using blind interaction on criminals with a banishment reason or execution reason gains piety. Not too sure about that. We do know of criminals uh, being executed quite often. The, the laws around criminals are kind of weird. Uh, one thing that could be done sometimes is that they could be put in a boat and pushed out to sea. And it could be left up to God, whether he would bring the boat back to shore or just let them drown. A gas man, that God. 
But lots of really interesting stuff here. Lots of really interesting stuff here. The blinding of prisoners and their removal from the chains of succession. I think that could be fantastic in a multiplayer game. For all the wrong reasons. So that's the traditions. Uh, something Mended said on one of my streams was that I should have looked at the decisions. I very rarely look at the decisions. I don't really I don't really focus too much on the on the decisions. The ones for Ireland in the base game aren't great, so I do very rarely actually look up here. I'm generally down here. Uh, here is Retire to Monastery. My ability to rule over the God-fearing people of Munster has become hampered for reasons which are now sadly all too obvious to those at court. I owe it to the legacy of the Valgash to put aside personal ambition and retire to the old monastery at Limnock. I gained the title Abbot, gained the trait Monk, and gained the trait Disinherited. Not too sure about Disinherited. We do know of people retiring to monasteries and then returning, but I think in, in the game, if you're retiring somebody to a monastery, you're not bringing them back. Uh, loses 75 Renown. I think this is a fantastic attempt to cap the amount of times you're going to use this. So I think that's actually a very good idea to have something in there to stop you from just spamming your way through rulers. Uh, found a Holy Order, which is going to be the Kayla Day, I believe. So we've had lots of discussions on this about how the Order of St. Patrick is absolutely terrible. So it has been changed in this mod. Here's one I'm not all that impressed with. I know Mandate is big into stuff like this, and I know that some players are, are big into stuff like this. The idea of regressing to, to pagan beliefs. I don't think we've ever seen an example of a converted... People converting away from paganism and then returning to paganism. But I know a lot of players are, are kind of obsessed with this uh, with this Celtic pagan type stuff and they, they like to play the game and here is an option for you to do that. For generations the Dalgash dynasty has worshipped God and heeded the teachings of the abbots as has been customary in Munster since time immemorial however there are whispers at court that petty King Thurlock of Munster's interests in Celtic theology now delves towards the occult and even that he is a witch who wishes to convene with the druids. He does convene with the druids. He convenes with the druids whenever there is a court case. So there's some stuff here about how you would um, you would effectively what do you do you change to the Gaelic religion, so we've the the Thuwe de are mentioned there and uh, lots of different stuff. Can we actually bring it up? So esotericism, Kayla, and sanctity of nature. This is a this is one that he's created himself. Hosting a feast earns piety. Vassals are more likely to attend feasts. What else away? What else away? The other big one is found a Celtic Empire. So I've often given out about the nonsense about um, founding Britannia or ruling Britannia as the Irish. Don't like it. Don't like this implication that the Irish would have pushed to uni unite the British Isles. If you've watched some of the recent videos, you'll know my problems with British Isles. British Isles is a concept that does not belong in CK3. Uh, but it is in there. Uh, it's mentioned a couple of times in a couple of different places. And uh, it's a much later political imposition. It has nothing to do with geography or anything like that. And the idea that the Irish would have tried to found Britannia is nonsense. It's not much more different to the idea that they might have tried to form a Celtic Empire. But we do know that Brian Brew was referred to as Imperator Scitorum, the Emperor of the Gael. We know that people from Scotland travel to Ireland to fight on Brian Brew's side at the Battle of Clontarf and that they may have owed vassalage to him or that they may have owed some um, some type of fealty to him. So what could have happened in the aftermath of the Battle of Clontarf if Brian Brew hadn't died or if his eldest son Murica hadn't died and if the kingdom had held together? Could the Irish have tried to possibly unite Ireland and Scotland? Could they have gone beyond that? We won't really know. Uh, we Irish are an ancient race with customs and traditions harking back to the mists of time. Though some of our kin have called themselves kings, none yet has dared to anoint himself emperor. When the, uh, with the traditional Celtic realms now under our control, such imperial ambitions are finally within our grasp. So you get the Celtic Empire and you gain the nickname the Father of the Celts.
And what are you looking for? Three of the Kingdom tier titles of Brittany, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, Cumbria, Ireland, the Kingdom of the Isles, and Galicia. So they'd be very strong cultural and even genetic ties between Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man. To a lesser degree, Wales and Cornwall. To an even lesser degree, Cumbria. And then to an even lesser degree, Brittany and the, the likes of Galicia and Northern Spain. Uh, some of this is, is part of a kind of modern memes around the kind of the creation of a, of a Celtic empire. A lot of people are joking that we should form Ireland, Scotland, Wales and a corridor down the coast connecting Scotland to Wales and just kick out the English. Uh, but here you have your opportunity to found the Celtic Empire to live out Brian Brew's dreams of becoming Emperor Scotorum, should you so wish, right? We've been talking, we've been talking a good chunk, we've been talking a good chunk about, um, about the actual mod. I'm very impressed, I'm very impressed with, with where everything has gone. I'm really excited to see what way the religious changes are going to play out and how they're actually going to impact the game. I'm not happy, not not delighted with how the Pope has been added in the base game. So, yeah, excited to see what way things are going to go here. Right, let's get started. The first thing we have to do is to pick a lifestyle. We're told that diplomacy is where we are strongest. We have family hierarch already uh, finished off, and I believe we actually gain a bonus because of Brehan Law. Was it Brehan Law? Or was it um, strong kinship? We will go with, so his diplomacy is, is fairly strong, I think we'll go with Majesty Focus. So we can push up our diplomacy options. Uh, writing history is going to give us the commission epic decision. I actually haven't done that um, a huge amount of times. We have the trade for gold, so we might go down, we might go down that route. I don't think we need to, with, with this one finished off, we're actually in a fairly good position to... To start. Uh, the next thing is let's actually take a look at our family. So we have two sons. So there is Markarthuk, who will succeed as the king of Munster, and there is Tyg. And there is Diarmid. So if I am correct, Markarthuk will succeed, but I believe it's actually Diarmid's family that um, that will then inherit afterwards. I think Diarmid actually deposes. Uh, Mark Arthuk. and if I'm thinking of the right time period, it's a bit confusing. But um, Mark Arthuk will succeed him, but will not actually the the later generations of the of the dynasty will not be his descendants. As far as I know, it's uh, Diarmid's descendants. So for nominate successor, we will nominate Mark Arthuk. So this is of course to uh, to have him succeed as the. Uh, ruler of Munster under Tanistry Elective. We're also told that Markarthuk is unmarried. So we'd better go and find a spouse for him. And we actually have a pretty good match, not too far away. I believe this is uh, Gladys. And a base there just in the kind of south of Gwynedd. So, not too far away at all. Her father has 890 troops. We'll send that proposal. If we take a very brief look at the political situation on the island, we have, of course, two independent regions down here to the south of us. Uh, in 1066 itself, Munster, all of Munster would have been under the rule of Thorlock, so these regions would be part of Munster. Uh, Dublin, so we have Murcha, Mach, Dirmada in Dublin, and here is Dirmid, his father. So Dirmid installed his son as king of Dublin, so these two regions would be effectively under Dirmid's control. Osri would be under Dirmid's control. Dirmid installed Thorlock, so Munster would be under Dirmid's control, and Connacht had also uh, submitted to Dirmid in Leinster. So all of this region would be under Diarmid's control, and Diarmid is, at this point in time, the High King of Ireland. 
Uh, Mead is under the control of Krahur, who is the, is he the son or grandson? He is the grandson of Moel Shocknail, who was deposed by Brian Brew, and then who ruled again as High King of Ireland, well, is regarded as High King of Ireland, uh, after Brian Brew's death. So Mead is under his control, uh, Brefni is, is under Connacht's control, and Connacht is under Leinster's control, and then up here, uh, this region is basically split between the two uh, branches of the Northern Enail. It's kind of a confused scenario up here. The, the Dalnaradi are... It'd be unfair to say that they're independent. But they've been kind of heavily defeated and pushed out of affairs. There's Kuola, who I played as in my, uh, my last playthrough. So what we're going to do is we're just going to come down to these guys and we're going to offer them vassalage. We'll offer them at normal feudal obligations. So we have Dermid of Loch Lane and uh, Murduk of uh, uh, Murduk McCarthy. So of the House Carthig. So this is where the, the McCarthy name comes from. His father was Carthig, if I am correct. There you go. Or Carthuk. So he is Mac Carthuk. And what are we going to look to do after this? We might actually do some raiding. We might actually do some raiding, if we can. Our current situation then, we have too few spouses. Uh, we can vassalize Earl Gilliforic. Is this because Ossery is being viewed as... in Leinster? So I'm not too sure why, why that is, why it's telling us that we can, um, we can vassalize him. It must be a different Gilliforic. There is a few of them. Well, there'll be no raiding for cattle because it doesn't look like we actually can raise our armies as raiders. I'm not too sure what was uh, what was making that and what was preventing that. Uh, here we have our bishop as one of our knights. Now, we'll have gone over this in previous videos that uh, bishops wouldn't really have fought in battles, but they could most certainly be commanders and... That's not happening as frequently in the 10 hundreds, most, most certainly in the 8 hundreds. So in the 867 start, you would have had bishops as commanders on a, a number of occasions. We don't have, yeah, we don't have a great court. We're going to, we're going to have to invite some knights, I would say. Yeah, we'll send out the herald and we will get some knights in. And the other thing we're going to look at is getting our court sorted out. So, all that I've done so far is I have appointed our bishop as court physician, Patrick, or Patrick, and Mercarthuk. I've appointed him as our bodyguard. I'm actually going to wait until these two regions come in before we make any other decisions, and we will start up for now and see what happens, and then make our plans. I think we're going to push into the Midlands. I think we're going to push into the Midlands and maybe wait until Diarmid uh, passes away before we actually make an attack on Leinster, or we might just pass uh, push um, uh, eastwards. So here is that marriage proposal for our son, and we see this massive expansion into Munster instantaneously. So here is uh, Mwerduk and Diarmid. Now Mwerduk hates us. Mwerduk hates us. He wants a seat in the council. And uh, who else do we have then? You also want a seat on the council. Lads, you're not great. You're not great. Lads, you're not great. So here's our son Taig, if I'm correct. Or is it a different Taig? It's a different Taig. Uh, he's useless. So Mwerduk could very well get that job. That's exactly what's going to happen. Uh, Mwerduk will get that job. And... Uh, Dermot is going to get that one. And then we're not doing too bad. We're not doing too bad with the... The Marshal and our Spy Master. And that is actually a fantastic learning for our Bishop. But of course, we are in a position, should we so wish to do... Uh, to actually re uh, to replace our uh, court chaplain, and we can, if we so wish, replace uh, replace them with a female. 
And with the addition of those two regions, we have now become the cultural head over uh, Aeth, or A, up in Connacht. And we're getting in some knights. Okay, we're going to have to decide what, uh, what way we're going to push. Uh, so these three areas are part of the Duchy of Meath, and then these areas are part of Leinster. Uh, what we're going to do, what we're going to do is we are going to see if we can fabricate a claim to Ossery. Oh no, he's causing trouble already. The insular world was shocked to learn that my bishop, Patrick, has been keeping a list of all who have ever wronged him, detailing the numerous ways he plans to get back at them and satisfy his lust for revenge. While scandals among the clergy are nothing new, it is disquieting for one to occur so close to home. We could condemn him for his transgressions. Uh, we gain piety, he loses 30 opinion. His opinion is quite low. Uh, he's going to become our rival. Uh, defend his character publicly. Maybe I should just stay silent. We're going to condemn him. And, oh, that was a lot more than uh, than 30. We're going to see if we can sway him. That's going to that's gonna take a while. I have no idea what's after going on over here, but uh, William the Bastard has decided he has better things to be doing with his time than fighting for England, so that war does not seem to have happened. And Harold will remain sitting there, uh, happy out for himself. We have just got news that our cousin has created a faction to install Krahur. So who exactly is Krahur? Let's let's go and take a look. Here is our cousin, Krahur, uh, Murica's chancellor. Is this Murica? Is look who this devil is? I actually forgot to check where he'd gone to. So there is Dunica. Our uncle, so Morica, I didn't realize this, has been given uh, County Clare. So this is basically totally wrong. Uh, Morica lost everything. Morica had absolutely no power or authority whatsoever. Uh, he is killed, I think, around this region in 1068, fighting a, a desperate bid to try and get some support to, to wage war on Munster. But yeah, no, Morica... Murica's is gone. Murica is utterly gone at this stage. Most certainly was not in control of the core Dalgosh lands. Was in control of absolutely nothing at this stage. Um, very fitting, however, that he has started a big debate to try and overthrow us. So it's, it's nice to see him here. It's nice to see him here being a devil. But um, most certainly was not in, in control of this region or any region uh, at this point in time. And what I did mean to do was to see. So there's one new friend. Let's go and visit our other new friend. And here he is, the man himself, the man with the big purse of money that he's only too glad to give out to everyone. Pope Alexander II, we have a bit of a problem, which of course is that uh, we don't have the piety. We're actually in a bit of a, a piety deficit at the moment. Now, uh, we could learn his language. Is it the fact that we don't have enough spouses? Yeah, that's uh, bringing that down. So this is the problem with having polygamy as part of the religion instead of having it as a tradition. The Pope is unimpressed that we don't have more than one wife. I think that kind of, you see, kind of creates these these circumstances, these weird circumstances. Uh, let's let's go let's go and pick up a few women for ourselves to uh, to get that deficit out of the way, and then I'm going to try out one more thing, one new option that's come in with one of the recent uh, updates or one of the recent patches. We could potentially get alliances with uh, a number of very young children. Or we could marry a, a number of young children to secure alliances to uh, some of the rulers in this region. I think uh, Ivania is one of them. But what we're going to go with is Gormla. She is a comely poet. So if we do actually get the, the king level title at some stage and we get a court going, 
we might be able to appoint her as our court poet. So I'm going to send that proposal. And the other thing that I want to do is if we come to our council, here is Mwiriduk, who joined us recently. And what we can do is we can challenge him to a board game. So I have no idea what this is. It is, I believe, a... A Norse board game. There is, from this time period and a bit earlier, an Irish board game, uh, Fickle. We have no idea how it was played. We have no description. We have a couple of boards from, from the time. It may have been something similar to uh, the Norse game. And we have Intrigue counters Martial, Martial counters Prowess, and Prowess counters Intrigue. When playing a board game, different playstyles counter your opponents. Countering their moves severely reduces their points gain. Do you know what? We'll figure it out. I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a tutorial, so there's going to be a bit of a wager. If we win, uh, we will lose some stress. We don't have any stress at the moment, but um, and we're going to be stressing out our Chancellor. Let's let's see what uh, let's see what another board game against our good friend Muriduk looks like. There you go, we lost and we gained 19 stress. So I know there is there is actual... Um, oh, he has better things to do and he told us to go away. Well, there you go. Divil. We got a wife anyway, so look, do you know what? It's not all bad. Uh, one of our vassals comes to us. As their petty king, my vassals owe me their allegiance. My word is law, but how much is obedience without devotion worth? In times of crisis, a slow response or a half-hearted effort can lead to disaster. Can I afford such a risk? So we could win their unwavering loyalty. We could gain dread, or we could try and improve matters with A in Connacht, who isn't a, a vassal, he's our ally. And let's try and be a generous liege for a while. We're not exactly making a, a whole heap of money on taxes anyway, so it's not going to impact us dramatically. So we're told that... We're told a couple of things. The the faction to install Krahur has collapsed. I presume Krahur has died, and that's why, because Murica has gone and found himself a candidate straight away afterwards. Our primary wife has become pregnant, and our marshal, Murica, I didn't actually notice that, has been showing off a promising new recruit. Uh, he may not be of as noble stock as you, my cousin. Your father killed my dad. Shut up, you. Uh, but on my name, I swear that U Moron is someone you would want on your side. Yara, do you know what? He's not the worst. And he's a lot cheaper as well than the uh, than the other lads. I hired one knight. He cost 45 quid. Lads, we're bankrupt. Well, that's right. We are actually going to bankrupt ourselves. I forgot about this part. Our... Bishop has prowled through documents, both ancient and of less certain provenance. I have finally had enough material to make the case that you are the rightful lord of the Earldom of Osri. All that I am missing is one little bribe. It's going to cost us 57. It's going to cost us 57, and it's going to throw us into a deficit for uh, for a while. How we need to begin pushing forward. See to it that it is done, and... Uh, we've organized a marriage for one of our knights. That has now heavily bankrupted us. So what I'm going to have to do is come to our council. We're going to have to try to put uh, Diarmid collecting taxes instead. So I had him increasing development. We're going to see if we can actually get him to, uh, to increase some taxes. And we're pretty much going to need to wage this war immediately. Uh, we can't wage war while in debt. Well, there you go. Yeah, the loss of the raiding option is a bit of a a bit of a loss to us. I'm not too sure where it went or what happened to it. 
Uh, some of our knights and their prowess are being improved greatly. We are failing utterly in our attempts to, to sway our bishop. Our piety is coming up um, a bit faster now. So we might be able to get some money together to ask the Pope for money. And we're coming towards the end of 1068, so this man's life... Uh, what's his name? Uh, Murica. His life should be coming to an end. Our wife, Dovkovlik, presents me with a perfect little daughter to be called Woman of Mead. Let's, uh, let's go for something else. Alva, sure. We have been granted a Diplomacy Lifestyle Perk. Now, is there much point in going for commissioning epics, which will allow us to spend gold that we don't have? Uh, the reduced title creation might be worth it. And we might very well need to actually change uh, when we're in a position to do so. Either to get the piety that we need to get some money off the Pope, or maybe even to stewardship uh, to actually focus on a monthly income. But uh, diplomacy, diplomacy isn't doing the best for us at the moment. Uh, we do have that patriarch trait we do indeed. So we have just been told that we can, we get a new uh, dynasty legacy. Wasn't expecting this. There's a few new ones. There's been a big uh, kind of expansion. Okay, well not maybe, maybe not a big expansion. Uh, tolerance, curiosity, and a profound understanding of what unites us. So we have language scholars. This is a new one I haven't seen yet. Cultural fascination progress. Okay, interesting. I don't think we'd be in much of a position to uh, to kind of to use that. Uh, what would be of benefit to us? Law, most likely. As a... As an individual of high uh, diplomacy. So this is kind of the, the stewardship uh, route. But there's a couple of things here that would help somebody with high diplomacy. Uh, there's guile. Blood erudition. So most likely, because we're going to have a, a lot of wars to fight at the start, quite possibly, I think going for uh, House Warriors. This seems to be a, a typical Irish start. Uh, we will go for the House Warriors tradition. Our bishop has gained uh, a bit of uh, opinion with us. What I'm going to see very quickly, I don't know if I can do this or not. I'm going to see if I can actually go on a pilgrimage while we are in debt. Because that would get us up to the... Piety needed to ask the Pope for money. So we'll prepare for the journey. And we would be going... We'd be staying We'd be staying close to home. Up to Armagh. That's where we'd be going. So we can indeed. It's going to put us into a, a hefty chunk of, of death. I'd hope that it's going to give us the... Um, the piety that we need to... Get some money off the Pope. As I prepare for my journey, I know that I will travel safely under the protection of God. Though I will not be gone for long, I pray for the well-being of the realm in my absence. Especially with that uh, with that fool. He's getting a bit of chunk of, uh, of military power together, but we have some very strong allies, including Connacht itself, through uh, the marriage of one of... Uh, it's our daughter. Our daughter and the son of the Duke of Connacht. Among my fellow pilgrims, there is a man who preaches compassion and fellowship until he reaches the topic of heathens. One evening around the campfire, he loudly declares them to be abominable monsters in the eyes of God, deviants, and child murderers all. Most people avert their eyes when he looks at them. Tonight I was not quick enough. Do you not agree, O oh petty king? They're not all bad. So we get sympathy for heathens. Domain taxes of different faith plus ten. Or we get disdain for heathens. Levy reinforcement rate goes up. I think we'll go for sympathy because... 
Wexford isn't actually under... It's not actually a different religion. It doesn't really make much of a difference. Uh, which one we go for. I don't think it's going to matter all that much. They're not all bad. That seems to kind of gel with the... Uh, with our syncretic folk traditions trait. I am finally here, body and soul, at the great Abbey of Ardvaka. As the abbot offers me blessings, I reflect on everything that had to happen for God to bring me here. At this moment in time, I have walked the holy path, so he does indeed get 250 prestige. And he gets enlightened pilgrim because of the syncretism, or the syncretic uh, tenet, is it? So... Diplomacy plus one, learning plus one. Different fates plus 20. Not too shabby at all. Uh, we're going to use that immediately. Immediately to spin down in this direction of the world and see if we are in a position to ask for gold. Uh, he won't accept because we need to get our reputation up with the Pope. This is turning into a bit of a disaster for Thorlock in his earliest days. It's good to be home. So that brings that to an end. And yeah, we're going to have to get our reputation up with uh, with this boil. Uh, what is it that is keeping the main thing down? So we've we've a lot of conflicting we've a lot of conflicting traits. We have a lot of conflicting traits at them. We'll we'll get that up. We'll get that up soon enough once we sort out our bishop. We are seeing a defeated army from Sleeve Mish, which would be way up here. Uh, defeated Dalnar the army. Marching down, whatever is going on up here. They're being raided. There's no point raiding me. I got nothing. And we've gotten a pop-up. Our friend Dermot has died and we've gained 40 stress. This is, of course, Dermot Machmael Namo, who I believe lived until about 1073, maybe a bit earlier. Uh, was killed in battle against... Where's he gone to? Uh, Krahur, with Thorlok on the sidelines watching. Uh, historically, of course, Dermot gave us the sword of Brian Baru, and he gave us uh, a couple of other things. But uh, he's after dying of old age at 68, and his son, who has uh, who has succeeded him now, uh, Murica has succeeded. So Murica, the king of, of Dublin, has succeeded as king of Leinster. So Leinster has become uh, has increased in power, and this is exactly what Dermot had wanted to happen on his death. But of course, historically, his son predeceased him. And we have seen E Valley fall to Connacht, and Connacht has now taken over from us. It has retaken its position because it seized Brefni and it seized E Valley, and it has now taken over as the head of the uh, the culture. Oh, this devil! The social. Uh, social manipulation, the first time it happened, I barely even gave it a moment's thought. But my cousin, Murica, has grown bolder. His challenges no longer pass unnoticed at the council table. He is testing my limits. The others are sure to follow, unless I give him a taste of his own medicine. So we could mock his foolishness. I drove your dad into exile. That's what we could do. So he is wrathful, impatient, and just. Uh, forgetting to invite him leaves him in the dark. He shall have tasks which are impossible to complete. We're mocking his foolishness. Uh, we think he's weak-minded or keeps to himself. Uh, cares about what other people think. That he would do everything in his power to get the tasks done. Now we go with this one. So Murica has lost 15 opinion of us. We have a son, Gofred. We'll give him a good Irish name. Krahur, why not? May you grow 
to, or may God grant you long life, my son. And we have that diplomacy perk. And we have that diplomacy perk. Can propose an alliance without a marriage. A title creation. I'm not too sure is that uh, you're able to use the Ducal Conquest causes Belli. We'll, we'll start there. And what we're going to have to do, I don't think we have much of a choice, uh, we're not actually in a position to do that just yet, is switch to the the stewardship focus. Because it's taking a hefty time to get out of this debt. I have actually switched from trying to uh, improve relations with our court chaplain, with our bishop, um, to trying to improve relations with the Pope to see if we can actually get some money out of him. The loss of the raiding mechanic has been... terrible. I'm not too sure why the raiding mechanic has gone, but as the Irish, at this point in time, the uh, the loss of that mechanic is absolutely... devastating. Connock's power grows further. They have seized Argyla. Not too sure how the how they've actually managed to to get all the claims together so quickly. They're making a nice chunk of money, and of course, as they actually expand, they are indeed making a nice chunk of money. But they're getting claims thick and fast. And they could very well, if they sweep down and take uh, Leinster, that could put us in a, a bad position. But of course, if A dies at any stage... Some of these regions are kind of going to split off and go in, in different directions. We're very close to coming out of debt. The twist and turns of fate have not always been to my advantage. God knows that I was cursed the day I met Earl Morica. Today, however, that curse has been lifted. Faith has smiled upon me. And brought that apparent knave to his grave. Uh, what happened to him? Died from his wounds. Not a day too soon we lose some stress, so indeed. Maybe five years too late. But just as happened historically, Thunica has died from his wounds. Like I said, I'm not too sure who he was actually fighting against. Now, he did have a couple of kills to his name. So he fought somebody in a duel in 1070. And then if we check his father, uh, Donica, Donica doesn't actually have any... Um, I thought Donica might have a, have a, a kill added for he is Kinslayer. Um, for killing his brother, Taig. So here's our father, Taig, who was murdered by Andonica's orders. So that's that's one bit of a nuisance out of the way anyway. And there's that faction has fallen apart, and it doesn't look like it's being, um, being re-established. As I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, uh, we are getting a good chunk of money together now, or we're nearly out of debt. We're coming towards the end of the year 1073, which is where I'm going to uh, call it for today. I did very quickly forget to do something. Um, we will win there. That's very well what he might have tried. No, I thought maybe he tried to um, to intimidate people and gained the, uh, the wounded trait. We will... Hmm, what's his opinion of ours? We're going to try and impress him to keep him from turning his attention in our direction. Uh, of course, what I have forgotten to do is to replace Morica with the man that he prepared to succeed him. I'd say we'll have to appoint his son, Brian, instead. Because he is a powerful vassal and he'll get, he'll get angry otherwise. Uh, we've only a couple of months left to go and we're out of debt. We've a couple of different options, one of which is to actually have Thorlock abdicate in favour of his son, which would have taken us out of debt. But it's actually a bit historically accurate that the period up until 
1073, 1074, that Thorluk has done very little. Basically, in this time period, what he was doing was uh, wandering around the uh, the region here, uh, especially in Osri, maintaining Diarmid's grasp on power, uh, supporting Diarmid's grasp on power, and uh, basically assisting his overlord in a very loyal fashion until eventually he turned against him, or at the very least, uh, decided not to aid him when uh, Krahur in Mead came and attacked him and killed him. And then that created the opportunities for Thorluk to uh, to expand and to um, first of all seize Osri, then Leinster, well Osri and Leinster together, uh, then I think it was Meath, and then cement his control over Connacht. Connacht has become, it's an ally, but it is also a powerful, powerful, powerful menace. And it's been able to grow that way through some financial mismanagement on Thorluck's behalf. We're actually already up to our, uh, nearly at our third diplomatic uh, trait. But we're going to try and see now on the next episode if we can... Uh, get out of this financial hole, and if we can expand Thorluk's rule, start going on the offensive, taking control of a couple of regions, get some money off the Pope, uh, get a couple of claims from the Pope, and see if we can't restore Thorluk to his rightful place as the High King of Ireland. Thank you for joining me on this historically accurate Munster CK3 playthrough, and I hope to see you on the next one.